is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker for the evening. Sriram V is a music historian, heritage activist, and entrepreneur. He's passionate about the heritage and history of Chennai and Tamil Nadu and pioneered the idea of heritage walks in Chennai. He writes regular columns on history and culture and has written several books, including Karnatak Summer, Lives of 22 Great Exponents. His most recent book is titled Chennai, A Biography, and it's available outside for sale, so please grab a copy. To take us through some fascinating stories from the book, please join me in welcoming Sriram. Good evening, friends. Thank you, Avehi, and thank you, Paul, and other members of Sarmaya for inviting me once again. It's always a great pleasure to be here and to this time it's a topic that is particularly close to my heart. It's about Chennai, the city. So uh, it's of course very difficult to put together a history in 45 minutes, but then I've just taken out the salient points of the city and I have uh, brought it together here. Uh, I thought I'd begin with the old adage about how everything south of the Vindhyas is Madras and how we all speak a language there called Midrosi and uh, or madrasi depending upon which part of north india we are from the whole thing then came to me that it wasn't very incorrect because until 1947 madras was the capital of a large tract of land that extended all the way from orissa right down to parts of karnataka and kerala and then down to the tip and madras was is somewhere here and therefore it is in a way you know, a large part of south of Vindhyas was a presidency called Madras with the city as its capital. And then in 1947, in 1930s, Orissa went away as a separate province. In 1947, we were Andhra and Tamil Nadu together in a very uncomfortable uh, coexistence, each most cordially hating the other. And then in 1953, following the fasting of Poti Sriramulu to death, Putti Sriramulu was encouraged to fast unto death, saying that if you threaten your fast, you know, Rajaji, who was then the chief minister, he will give in, and then the states will be bifurcated. But they didn't know that Rajaji was a very tough nut to crack. He allowed Putti Sriramulu to die. And then after that, you know, whole of Andhra went up in flames. Jawaharlal Nehru then interceded. And then finally, in 1953, the first linguistic division of states, and then the whole of the northern part went away, leaving behind what was known as Madras state, with Madras as its capital. Interestingly, the Andhras and the Tamils fought over Madras as well. So the Andhra said Madras Manade, which is ours, and the Tamils said Madras Namade, which is, you know, just a small juxtaposition of letters, and there was a tiff over who would get the capital city, eventually the Tamils won, which is why even today the capital city is in an uncomfortable tip of the northernmost tip of the entire state. And for years, we've been talking about shifting the capital to a more central location like Trichy, but we haven't done it, and I don't think we'll ever do it. So Madras, south of the Vindhyas, is not exactly a wrong definition. Every year, we celebrate on August 22nd what we call as the founding of the city by the British in 1639. We couldn't be more wrong than that because the first Paleolithic settlement in the whole of Asia was discovered in what is today Madras. So 45,000 years ago, we had an existence. Uh, in places like Pallavaram and Egmore and all that, we found settlements of the Paleolithic Age, of the Iron Age, and so it, ha it is a very ancient region. And uh, then came the Pallavas in the 6th and the 7th centuries, and it was around this area that they pioneered rock cutting and building shrines inside it. Prior to that, all Tamil shrines were made of wood, they were made of brick, they were made of metal, and the cutting of living rock and scooping it out and building a temple say, simultaneously was going on in various places, in Badami, in Karnataka, in the south, in, uh, in and around Chennai, in the Palla, in wherever the Pallavas were ruling. And even today we have a specimen. This is called now Mola Ka Pahad, and it's a mosque but it was a temple at one point of time. What is interesting is that Chennai is a city where these kind of changes are very comfortably lived with, and there is no conflict. There has never been any conflict historically 
Uh, it's a city where there has never been an inter-religious riot uh, in its entire history. But if you ask me about intra-religious riot, I can tell you any number. <laughs> so the Ayers versus the Iyengars, the Shia versus the Sunni, the Catholic versus the Protestants, and so on and so forth. We even had something called the left hand and the right hand riots, which were a vertical division of caste with the Brahmins above, and then everybody else divided into two groups called the left hand castes and the right hand castes, and they were bent upon killing each other. The British got severe headaches trying to resolve it. There were all kinds of things. Even today, we've not been able to understand what this left hand, right hand division was. But yes, overall, we live very comfortably with each other, and we've we coexist very peaceably. The region itself goes back by several centuries, as I said, and even in the first century AD, Periplus of the Eritrean Sea, which is a Greek tra tract, which talks about the various ports of India with which the Greeks were doing trade, mentions various locations on the Coromandel coast. And uh, the Sangam poetry, which is a very unique uh, set of classical works, that stretches from 600 BC to 300 AD, and which is in Tamil, celebrates the arrival of the Greeks and the Romans. It talks about trade. It talks about conditions of harbors. And it's very interesting to see that the harbors have not changed all that much. It's just the technology that has changed. But the, you know, the surrounding areas are still the same, the way sailors come, where the goods are piled up, where customs officials are inspecting everything that goes on. So it gives you a very beautiful word picture of what harbors were on, in this particular area. And there appear to have been a number of small port villages and port towns stretching all around the eastern coast. And the Bhakti movement, which comes about between the 7th and the, between actually the 5th, 6th, 7th and the 8th centuries, when uh, Tamil versifiers adored Shiva and Vishnu in verses. We have a number of uh, verses dedicated to villages today, which are today a part of Chennai city. And uh, all of them describe temples which still exist, which are still in worship. So we do have a continuous existence. This temple, for instance, has a continuous record of worship without any break, starting from the third century onwards until date. It has traces of every empire that came in the middle, including the East India Company. It's called the Thiruvatriyur Tyagaraja Swami Temple in Thiruvatriyur, one of the northern parts of uh, Chennai and an industrial area and a depressed area as well, but with a beautiful uh, temple in the middle. In the midst of all this, we also have the arrival of the legend of St. Thomas. So St. Thomas, the apostle, is supposed to have come here shortly after the crucifixion, preached over here and died over here. Initially recorded as died over here, then recorded as martyred over here. And there is this basilica called the Santome Basilica, which is in the heart of Mailapur, which is one of the most orthodox and religious localities possible. In the midst of that, you have this church, which is the, and one of only three places rec recognized across the world as a church where uh, an apostle of Jesus is buried. So the Catholic Church recognizes Santiago de Compostela in Spain, which was where St. James is buried, then St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, and St. San Tome in Madras, where St. Thomas is supposed to be buried. The body, incidentally, has traveled back in the 3rd or the 4th century and kept traveling for quite some time till it reached Ortana in Italy. What we have left is a small piece of the finger, and that relic was periodically exhibited the last time being in the 18th century. But the basilica itself is what you see today is only a 19th century construction, but we do have records of it having existed at least from the 7th and the 8th century onwards. Marco Polo, when he came here in the 14th century, has recorded the uh, presence of a community that venerated St. Thomas in this particular location. The Portuguese were very attracted by this particular legend, and because they were very close to the Vijayanagar rulers starting from the 14th century onwards, they came here in the 16th century and they set up base around this locality where St. Thomas was buried. And that became San Thome, the village of St. Thomas. So the Portuguese have had a presence in Madras since then. And even today, 
there are words in Tamil which go back to Portuguese. And uh, we merrily use them without realizing, you know, how much these things have been influenced. Then came the Dutch. The Dutch came in the 17th century and as Rajarshi mentioned in his presentation, they came to a place called Pulikat, which is slightly to the north of uh, Chennai. They were in Machlipatnam, then they came down to Pulikat. And if they had stayed on, we would all be speaking in their language, whatever that is. But uh, they, they were a very powerful presence and they came here essentially for trading in cloth, just as he mentioned. And the, it's very interesting that while the West Coast, the colonials came essentially for trading in spices, in the East Coast they came essentially for trading in cloth. And the Dutch fine-tuned certain practices which the British would then take over. Pulikat itself is a natural lagoon and they obtained permission from the rulers of the remnants of the rulers of the Vijayanagar Empire to trade over there. Today you have very little to show of the Dutch presence but there is a lovely church over there. And uh, then the British came in 1639. The British were following the Dutch essentially. So they were in Surat, not very successful. Then they made it to the east coast. They came to Machlipatnam where the Dutch were already present not very successful and then Francis Day, one of their agents, was sent down south to scout for a piece of land where they could set up a trading post and that is how he arrives in what is today known as Madras or Chennai. Francis Day coming in 1639, he meets up with the Nayaks who were the representatives of the Vijayanagar rulers. So there was Damarla Venkatadri Nayak and Damarla Ayyappa Nayak and uh, it is very interesting that when Francis Day came down, he had a translator who was from Palakollu, which Rajarshi mentioned in his speech. So, Beri Timapa of Palakollu was the translator for Francis Day, and he comes along, and finally they get a grant of what is called uh, two miles of no man's sand. Basically, it's just nothing that just a sandy waste by the sea, and the British were asked to set up a fort over there. When they said a fort, they basically meant an enclosure where they could store cloth. Ships would call periodically and then the cloth would be exported. This was the whole idea with which they came. Nobody knows till date as to why Francis Day felt that this was an ideal location. The weather is bad right through the year. You have only three seasons, the hot weather, the hotter weather and then the hellish weather. And then it was not a natural harbour. Unlike Pulikat, where there was a lagoon into which ships could sail very easily, unlike Machlipatnam, ships couldn't come anywhere near the coast. So they had to stand two miles in the sea in a place called Madras Roads. And I'll come to that a little later. The, but Francis Day in his description says that paintings and printed cloth was available in plenty in this particular area and 20% cheaper than what they were getting in Machlipatnam. So finally the British are encouraged to abandon their settlement in Machlipatnam and come down and start work on what they would call as Fort St. George, which is the fort that they begin in 1640. They arrive in 1639 and then in 1640 they begin completing the fort. The fort expands over a period of time. It starts off as a small stockade, then it grows bigger, 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 bigger. Finally, it occupies 100 acres. And it was completed in 1780, after which no war was ever fought and the fort was really not needed. But it became the administrative headquarters of the city and of the state, and it remains that way. The British came here as traders. They were interested in cloth. And it is very interesting, even today you can trace how the city expanded. So first was the fort itself. And that was in the records, in the grant that the Nayak gave them. He says, our village of Madras Patnam. So there was clearly a village called Madras, in which the British were coming. So the British clearly didn't found Madras, so to speak. There was a small hamlet in which they decided to start their fort. Just behind it came up what was called Blacktown. Blacktown was essentially where all the, you know, supplementary services, the money lenders, the translators, the cooks, the carpenters, the water bearers, everybody would be living. And that had a temple right in the middle to Chenna Keshava. And Chenna Keshava Perumal temple even today stands and it's now shifted from where it was to a different location, but it is still there. 
Probably that gave rise to the name Chenna Kesava Perumal Patnam. While this was Madras Patnam, that was Chenna Kesava Perumal Patnam. Over a period of time, the English continuously referred to the place as Madras. The Indians in all their correspondence referred to it as Chennapuri or Chennapatnam. Gradually, over a period of time, it became almost certain that Madras is an English name, Chennai is a Tamil name, and in 1996, it became very convenient to change the name because of that. What was forgotten was that there was no Chennapatnam before Madras. Madras was the name that existed when the British came, and it was already here, and it wasn't a British name, so to speak. The British then began settling weavers inside Madras city itself because they didn't want to go all around the place. They didn't know the local language and they needed a community of people who would conduct the business on their behalf. And these were the Dubashis or Dvibhashis, men who knew two languages. So they would either know Telugu or Tamil and they would know Portuguese. Portuguese was the common language. Then they learnt English over a period of time. And it is very interesting that they were operating in a scenario where neither of the contracting parties knew the language of the other. That cloth weaver had no idea what price he was selling it to the British. The British had no idea what price the Dubash was contracting. So the difference went into the pocket of the Dubashes. The Dubashes bought enormous tracts of land around Madras. They got into rent farming. And as the empire expanded, they went along with the British. They went further down south to Tanjavur. Wherever the British went, they went along with them. They were really the eyes, the hands and the legs of the British. And they did, they ran private armies. You name every corrupt modern practice, the Dubash had already done it. So if today the Dubashes were to come back, they wouldn't be surprised at anything that was happening now. Land grab, all of it. They had done all, everything. And by the time they grew old, they got worried about afterlife. So they began building temples to commemorate themselves. <laughs> and today, all around Chennai, particularly the older parts of Chennai, you have any number of temples that were built by the Dubashas. But we have such a poor sense of history that you ask any average Chennaiite, how old is this temple? 2,000 years, sir. Everything is 2,000 years old in our city. There's a very comfortable, respectable uh, age that we give. We endow it with an antiquity that it doesn't possess. The Nayaks were eventually displaced by the Nawabs of uh, the Sultans of Golconda and they had their local representatives who were the Nawabs of Arcot. Over a period of time as the, as the power of Golconda, you know, the Mughal Empire came down, the Mughal Empire reinforced the power of the Nawabs of Arcot and then when the Mughal Empire itself began to weaken, the Nawabs of Arcot became the real rulers of the region and the British had to treaty with them, so to speak. Gradually, the British were very, you know, they realized that there was a lot more money to be made in fighting off and in getting rival kings to fight with each other than just to be in the cloth trade. The man who really taught them this trick was a Frenchman, Duplex, who was in Pondicherry, which was a French settlement. So you had everybody within a few kilometers of each other. You had the Dutch in Pulikat, and then in nine locations going down all the way to Kanyakumari. You had the British in Fort St. George, you had the Portuguese in uh, San Tome, then you had the French in Pondicherry, you had the Danes in Tarangampadi, so everybody was here on this eastern coast. And the French duplex was the man who really realized that there's a lot more money to be made and land to be grabbed by getting the children of the Nawabs of Arcot to fight amongst each other. Finally, in the 18th century, there was this massive conflict between Muhammad Ali and Chanda Sahib, two rival claimants to the Arcot throne. The French support Chanda Sahib, the British support Muhammad Ali. And that is when an unknown writer in the British East India Company called Robert Clive really comes into his own. And Clive engineers the defeat of Chanda Sahib and Muhammad Ali becomes the Nawab of Arcot. After that, Clive is perhaps the greatest hero as far as the East India Company is concerned. He retires with a lot of wealth, goes back to England, has mental issues. Clive was forever battling mental issues. And then comes back to India because now Bengal has to be conquered. Once they reach Bengal, they realize that this Chennai or Madras was nothing in comparison to what Bengal is all about. And so Clive teaches them what Bengal can give. And finally, when there is a commission of inquiry in parliament, he defends himself by saying, gentlemen, I was amazed at my own moderation. 
there was so much more that I could have stolen from that place. He doesn't say that, but he says I was amazed at my own moderation. So interest gradually shifts to Calcutta, interest shifts to Bombay, which comes about in 1681, Calcutta in 1689. So Madras is really the place from where everything moves out. And so the British army really takes its birth, what is the Indian army today, takes its birth in the 1750s in Madras city. The first bank run on western lines begins in 1641, 1642, inside Fort St. George. The oldest civic body in the entire country is the Madras Corporation, which begins in 1688. And uh, even now it functions the same way, with the same levels of energy. And the, the archives, the oldest archives in probably the whole world is Madras archives now called the Tamil Nadu Records Office, where if you go and search for something, you'll probably have to be there for as many number of years before you find it. It's one of the most painful experiences to go through, but it does exist. The Nawab of Arcot was technically the ruler, but now he was beholden to the British. And eventually he was not very comfortable in Arcot, and he wanted to come down and live in Madras. To build a suitable residence for the Nawab, the contractor Paul Benfield, who was one of the most corrupt contractors of the British uh, Public Works Department of that time in the uh, 1760s, he designs what is called the Chepok Palace. The Chepok Palace becomes the residence of the Nawabs in Madras. It was the first time that the British were building in a style that was a combination of Hindu, Islamic and Western architecture. So this building really marks the start of what is known as the Indo-Saracenic style. Indo-Saracenic style eventually will morph into the Bombay Gothic and so on and so forth. And finally culminate in Rashtrapati Bhavan in, uh, in New Delhi. But Indo-Saracenic had its birth in Madras. For a hundred years after this palace was built, it lay dormant. Then in the 1860s, there was a massive rediscovery of Indo-Saracenic. And even today, Madras city has a number of buildings constructed in that style. And that is where this unique you know, style really begins. The East India Company technically forbade its servants from doing any moonlighting. It was like Wipro. So, you know, <laughs> the, but unlike the Wipro executives, the average East India Company servant got five pounds a year as his salary. And the life expectancy was two years because given the heat and given the lifestyle and the lack of awareness of what health was all about, it was a dog-eat-dog -dog world in Fort St. George. The average man would come die within two years. By the time they were 18 or 19 or 20 or 21, they would surely be dead. Even as they were being buried north of the, north of the fort, their effects would all be auctioned at the entrance of the fort itself. The successors would be buying it and then selling it at a profit. So this is how it went on all the time. Now because the, the company Bahadur forbade trade, everybody had to be, they had to earn money on their own, somewhere on the side. What they did was they brought all their relatives from abroad and settled them in the fort. So you had your idiot nephew, the illiterate uncle, and many of them had you know, wife, they started businesses in the name of the wife or sometimes in the, as in the case of Elihu Yale who went on to found Yale University with his donation, stolen essentially from Madras city. It was in the name of his mistress that he was really running many of his businesses. So they were all making money on the side hand over fist. Company invariably made less money than what they were doing privately and that was called private trade. Eventually these Cousins and nephews and all of them who were in private trade, they would enter into partnerships, they would start businesses of their own. And by 1799-1800, they had to be recognized as a real organized setup. And an entire district in the north of Madras called First Line Beach, which we today call Rajaji Saleh, where HSBC and other banks all have their offices. That is where the British businesses established themselves and moved. In 1836, Inspired by the Bombay Chamber of Commerce, which was started in the middle of September, on 29th September 1836, they banded together and founded what was called the Madras Chamber of Commerce. They applied for permission to the governor of Madras. Governor of Madras said, where are the Indians in this? There were 14 of these English people, two Armenian business houses. They said, we need, he said, you need to get Indians into it. So they got two Indian companies as well. And that is how the Madras Chamber of Commerce was formed. 
they had only one interest which was to buy raw material from here send it to england get it finished come bring it back sell it at enormous profits on the, in in madras and in the surrounding areas so from the 19th century onwards the company's power waned and by 1850s the company was over in any case it was these british business houses you had names like binney parry arbuthnot and company best and company gordon woodruff these were all the big names in uh, madras history and they would really rule the roost and they they began bringing in many of the public amenities that we recognize today for instance the railways when they came to madras in the 1850s they the railway station was just at the northern end of this road and it's in a place called royapuram and today it is the oldest railway station in india pakistan bangladesh burma and sri lanka the reason is the older railway stations have been demolished so we were promoted and we now we've become the oldest railway station the railways wanted to demolish the station but then the high court has uh, prevented it by a stay most heritage buildings survive only because of stay orders and that is how the railway station in royapuram also has survived the then they you know the telegraph offices these were all contributions by the madras chamber but by the 1870s they did what was perhaps the most uh, the most beneficial uh, contribution to the city was to lobby for a harbor in madras till then you didn't have a harbor 1639 the city had been founded till 1875 every ship stopped 2 miles in the sea in a place called madras roads and a series of catamarans woven pieces of wood with men wearing nothing other than a loin cloth and a conical cap on their head they would row with dubashes in them and every man woman child and goods on the ships would be welcomed by these people they would be lowered on the backs of these coolies on to the catamaran then the catamaran would row them ashore everything going from madras would be rowed on these catamarans to the ships and then the ships would set sail there was enormous confusion in the it's like it was exactly like the auto rickshaw service of chennai of today so you were dependent on the auto rickshaw and if they went on strike ship will be there goods will be here no way will the two be able to communicate with each other there was no harbor so letters would the captains would forget to deliver the letters to the catamaran so the letters would travel to calcutta or colombo and come 3 months later very often the letters wouldn't come at all the catamarans would wait for a high point in the water and then they would demand more money from the passengers who were on the catamaran and if they didn't give the money they'd be nudged into the water <laughs> so it was said that around 80% of the goods that managed that horrible journey of 6 months from london to madras perished in that last 2 miles in the sea so this was the problem and the catamaran operators were a law unto themselves many times the, exactly like the auto rickshaw service the government tried its best to regularize the fares auto rickshaw man would go on strike same way with the catamaran operator the harbor would come down to its knees so finally in 18th and bombay and calcutta and colombo lobbied to ensure that madras wouldn't get a harbor so the vested business interest they said this city doesn't need it we are all doing very well railways are connected city can manage without a harbor but finally in the 1870s there was a huge recession in england and there was surplus steel they had to do something with it so they said give madras the harbor that it wants so in 1875 work began on a harbor it was one of the, it's it was finally documented that it was the greatest challenge that mankind had ever faced against nature to construct a harbor for madras city the construction went on till the early 1900s and finally we got a harbor in place nobody appreciated the construction of the harbor at that time it was a massive project you know work had started work would get over finally in 1914 we were so excited about having a harbor that we were like a kid on its birthday so we left all the lights on in the harbor in the night in september when the first world war had been declared and a german ship called emden came right into the harbor we were inviting it in the dead of night and you know good old madras goes to bed by 7:30 nobody was awake at that time when the ship came in and it threw a set of shells on the city it bombarded the city and fled and immediately the city emptied itself next day morning there was nobody in madras because there was a panic and uh, even today we have a word in tamil emden because that's the name of the ship 
So Emden means a villain, a bully, that even today in Tamil, not forgotten 108 years later. And the Kaiser, German Kaiser, was so happy that he allowed every crew member on that ship to hyphenate the word Emden to himself. So even today you have families like Müller Emden, Schmidt Emden, etc., etc., in Germany, because they were all, their ancestors were on board that ship. It was one of the biggest strikes against a British Empire city. So in the, nine, in the First World War, we were the only city to be bombarded in the whole of the Indian Empire. In the Second World War, ironically, on the East Coast, we were the only city not to be bombarded. So Calcutta was affected because of the, you know, war reaching Burma and the Far East and, you know, the allied for the Axis powers coming over with Subhash Bose marching towards the Japanese coming. And then Kakinada was bombed, Colombo was bombed, Madras was spared. And that is when the value of this harbour was realised. Because this became the only exit point on the Eastern Command from which American forces could be sent out, war supplies could be made. Defence industries began to be settled in Madras city. Bini and company had to supply cloth to the entire British army. The population of the city doubled during the Second World War. It was four and a half lakhs prior to the war. It became eight lakhs at the end of the Second World War. And we never looked back after that. So the harbour was a major factor, often completely overlooked in today's history because we take it for granted that we've got a harbour. But that was really the transformational effect. But if we didn't have a harbour in the 1860s, and so we completely missed out, for instance, on the cotton boom, which is what Bombay really benefited by. For instance, during the American Civil War, when cotton was not reaching London from the United States, and Bombay went through a five-year boom, which is why all this, you know, you have the university, you have Sir Jamshed G. 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 Boy, uh, what is this, what's his name, Ready Money, and all of them, they all made their money in the cotton boom. Uh, well, uh, the, but we didn't have that because we didn't have a harbour, in a sense. It's only after that, that during the Second World War, that things really changed. Now, Chennai is supposed to be today an automotive capital. We contribute 33% of the country's automotive components and automobiles. And uh, we make one vehicle every 30 seconds. One passenger, one uh, passenger car, and we make one heavy vehicle every 90 seconds. That's Chennai's record today. And that really starts with the arrival of the harbour. Because with the arrival of the harbour, two things happened. One, petroleum began to come, and the other was chassis. Car chassis began to be imported, and custom-made bodies began to be built in Madras for the use of Maharajas, uh, aristocrats who wanted, and then buses came to be built over a period of time. The city gradually established itself as a place where bus bodies and automobile works were happening. And by the 1920s, apart from the British companies that were into the automobile business, a number of Indians got into automobile trade. They began importing uh, components, they were into servicing of vehicles, they were into importing of chassis, they were importing of vehicles and they were selling it. Slowly the city was establishing itself as a automobile uh, centre, but it didn't have anything different compared to what, say, a Calcutta was or a Bombay was. But the difference was that in Calcutta you had jute and you had a number of other business interests, heavy engineering interests. In Bombay you had finance at all times. Madras didn't have much of that. Its finance industry was very, very small in comparison. So automobile was one of the big employment factors. Then in the in the, in the immediate aftermath of uh, independence, when there was the industrial policy resolution which said that each of the three port cities would set up an, automotive manuf an automobile manufacturing unit, there was a man called Anant Ramakrishnan who had by then been working for a company called Simpson & Company, which was founded in the 1840s and which was into the automobile trade. He began amalgamating a number of British businesses that were very anxious to sell and leave. And he started a company called Amalgamations Limited. And he was the visionary who really saw the potential that the automobile had. And what he then did was in 1949, even before a single automobile was being made in India, he set up the first automotive component manufacturing company, a company called India Pistons, which was into making of pistons and piston rings for automobiles. And he really spearheaded the automobile component manufacture and vehicle. He never got into cars. He did get into cars. 
he was forced out of it he then went on to make tractors and that is how tractors and farm equipments would come but that would transform the city into a mass he didn't live very long he was only 59 when he passed away but uh, he had achieved quite a bit and if this was one then you had companies like the TVS which came from Madurai but more importantly even before Anantarama Krishnan got into manufacturing there was the Murugappa group they had been in the in uh, Burma and other places but by the 1930s they realized that the writing was on the wall as far as Burma was concerned they were not going to get back their money that they were investing there so they got into manufacturing and it began with the manufacturing of steel cupboards in a place called Ambatur and then they got into abrasives and slowly you had an entire you know industrial setup coming in a place which is even today Ambatur is the recognized it's now become an IT setup but then that is where industries really began Thiruvatriur and Ambatur these were the places and that is how things moved on and if we have today an industrial base it's because of these visionaries and these pioneers the city is also known for its phenomenal education base uh, you ask anybody what is it that you want your children to do I want them to study well this is we've got one of the highest enrollments possible in lower education and higher education across the entire country and we've been topping the charts for quite a number of uh, years now so this really starts with the missionary institutions so sometime in the early 1800s the Christian missionaries they were the people who began providing education outside of caste and making it possible for anybody and everybody to enter the education setup gradually become a part of the English speaking uh, communities get into government service and so on and so forth then in 1857 along with Bombay and Calcutta we get the Madras University and that is the headquarters even today the Senate House a building that is now sadly locked up and is not in use but at least it is surviving and we need to be thankful for that but the education base would then result in a few things one is that we are a we are a city where the soft skills but till very recently always given the go by so if somebody said they wanted to get into history or English literature it was as though doom had descended on the entire family my father when I was 11 sat sat down next to me in Calcutta I still remember and said so what would you like to do I said I want to become a journalist and like Shah Jahan at the death of Mumtaz he aged in the next five minutes I could see wrinkles coming down his hair graying and uh, then he sat down and gave me a long lecture about how we are middle class people we have to earn it's all right for Rabindranath Tagore to go around with his bag and sing poems it's not okay for you you have to become an engineer and so on <laughs> so I finally be did become an engineer but engineering medicine accountancy these were the careers that the typical standard Chennaiite aspired to for long but things have changed completely in the last 10 years engineering colleges are going a begging and today it's all about visual communication memes stand-up comedy all kinds of things that my poor father would have shuddered at <laughs> but an outcome of all this was that we had a ready base of engineering people when the you know the liberalization came the automotive industries came more importantly we became a medical capital we have had we have medical schools and hospitals that go back by two centuries the general hospital of Madras which is run by the government started in the 1650s and it has been operating from the same location since 1777 the the Institute of Mental Health is 227 years old the first bypass surgery was done in the railway hospital in, in India was done in the railway hospital in Perambur the second oldest eye hospital in the whole world is in Madras in a place called Egmore it's called the regional Institute of ophthalmology so when the private hospitals came there was a ready base of talented doctors who could be drawn Today, if you ask anybody in Calcutta about what they know of Madras, they'll say only two things. One is Opollo and the other is Shankor Netraloy. <laughs> For them, that's their idea of a holiday. They just love it. The average people in the Northeast, they have only two locations. As I said, one is Apollo and the other is Shankar Netralaya. One completely run with a profit motive and the other one completely run with a non-profit motive. Both centers of excellence in their own way. And the... Uh, the I was told recently by a doctor in Shankar Netralaya that Bengalis when they come down to Madras 
if they don't have a medical issue to go to Shankar Netralaya, they still go outside it and take a selfie and go back <laughs> to say that they have seen Shankar Netralaya. So we are the medical tourism capital of India, incidentally. We contribute almost 40% of India's medical revenue, medical tourism revenue. We very happily add it to our general tourism revenue, so we top the tourism charts year after year, even over and above Delhi, Agra and Jaipur. We are ahead of the golden triangle when it comes to footfalls. Essentially, they are not footfalls. They are wheelchairs and stretcher <laughs> falls, but that's what is happening. When we are also one of the major centers for leather. The, uh, the leather story begins with, uh, ah, it's got paralyzed. Ah, there they are. Okay, the leather story begins again from the 1800s. 49% of India's leather goes through Madras Harbour. And we have an entire ecosystem going all around Tamil Nadu where you have the leather manufacturing uh, units. It of course starts with British times when a number of Muslims in the entire hinterland got into leather. And because, strangely enough, a number of Brahmins got into it as well. I have no idea how. But there were also lots of Iyers and Iyengars, particularly Iyengars. They were into leather business for a long period of time. And uh, then we had a very dynamic scientist called Nayudama, Dr. Y. Nayudama, who came to head the uh, Center for Scientific and Industrial Research and the Central Leather Research Institute. And he made Madras a center for leather. So these are three businesses, the medical, the automotive, and the leather, in which we keep topping year after year. Every year in December, we have what is called the December music season. It is the, it's been going on for 96 years. And it is entirely run by private initiative. Uh, if it's, in a way, it's good that we don't have any government support because I cannot imagine filling up forms in triplicate and awaiting grants. It will never happen. But this is that one time of the year for 15 days when the weather is relatively tolerable. And we have around 60 organizations that put up around 2,500 music and dance performances, classical music and classical dance performances, and uh, entirely funded, as I said, by private initiative. It's been a remarkable success story for a very niche art. On an average, there'll be just around 20 to 30,000 people in the whole city who will be fond of this. But still, NRIs make it a point to come. Um, lots of foreigners get interested in it. Academics come down, they present papers and all that. Interestingly, in the midst of all this, we are also the chess capital of India. We have a reasonable sports history, but chess has been the one great success. The, it's uh, chess and carom board. In, interestingly, the world champion for carom is still in Chennai, Maria Urdayam, who it started with a very depressed industrial neighborhoods where, you know, people would play carom and that's how they honed it into a fine art. But chess has really uh, taken us to the top of the charts and recently, as you know, the chess Olympiad happened there. Despite all these things, there is the great water scarcity in our city. This Chennai is a city with, which can make it to the news regularly for two things. Either it is water scarcity or it is a surplus of water. It's one of, it's never somewhere in the middle. And it is just not today that it is, British records are full of water problems. So even when they settled in Fort St. George, they began complaining about brackish water. And today people in Chennai keep lamenting, we have to buy water. The British were doing exactly the same thing. They were buying water. And uh, the quality of water was bad. They were dependent on rainwater. They were tapping into rivers all around the city. And that battle has continued unabated ever since. Uh, every year, by the month of February, we'll get this photograph in the newspapers. This is the principal water reservoir in Pujar. <laughs> so the same tower and that water below it, 15 days water left, 3 days water left. Then Leonardo DiCaprio will be tweeting about it. And that's when many people in Chennai really realize that there is a water scarcity. Up to then, they have never known about it. When DiCaprio tweets about it, oh God, there must be something really bad going on in our city. And then you'll have all these messages about how lakes have been built over these real estate sharks. They must be taught a lesson. Then it rains and then life goes on. You know, more lake lakes are filled in, real estate sharks, all that goes on forever. But there has been a greater awareness in recent times. Rainwater harvesting as a technology was really pioneered by a man called Shekhar Raghavan in the city. And he made it his life's mission to educate people about how the city needs rainwater harvesting. Nobody listened to him. Then in 1995, Jayalalitha 
suddenly took notice of the fact that there was a man called Shekhar Raghavan who was going around talking about rainwater harvesting. She went on television and appealed to the people to get on to rainwater harvesting. That made a difference. It rained as though in blessing and by the time the rainwater harvesting was in place, the city was relatively free of water scarcity for some time. Then people realized that why do we need to do rainwater harvesting? Somebody, our neighbor is doing it in any case. So the water will anyway go up in this. So I don't need to spend money on it. But my building needs a certificate for completion saying that I have got rainwater harvesting. I'd bribe the man 10,000 rupees only while a real rainwater harvesting investment takes one lakh or some such thing. So 10,000 rupees bribe gets me a rainwater harvesting certificate. Entire streets did this, no rainwater harvesting, but they had certificates in their position. So nature came back to teach us a lesson in 2005, 2008 and so on. Then in 2015 we had the great floods. After which we seem to have woken up and we appear to be saner and better. We are building more reservoirs to tap the rainwater. Last, my last story for the city is of course about, about our cinema and its connection with politics. So our, we are a very different city in many ways. <laughs> and uh, there are two threads that really converge onto this uh, final slide of mine. One is the battle for equality and the other is cinema. So the Tamil Nadu politics, as people call it, Dravidian politics. They just say, ah, Dravidian parties, Dravidian politics. They vote for themselves. They carry on in their own way and so on. But the real, it starts with a very noble premise of social equality. So long before Baba Sahib Ambedkar and others, the fight for recognizing the rights of the downtrodden had begun in Madras. It began even in the closing years of the 19th century. Ayodhya Das Pandidar was really the pioneer who began fighting for Dalit rights. Then came Ratamalai Srinivasan, then came M.C. Raja. By 1918, 1920, you had a strong anti-Brahmin movement. And you had a party called the South Indian Liberation Front, which ran a newspaper called The Justice. And that is how the party came to be known as the Justice Party. And in, by the early 1920s, the British government had already begun allowing for voting on a partial franchise in the provinces. And so you had elections, and the Congress was not contesting the elections. The Justice Party stood, and they won. And they formed a cabinet of three ministers under the governor, British governor, who kept most of the portfolios to himself in any case. But in 1921, Madras had passed what was the first reservation bill when 25% of government employment was reserved for Brahmins, 25% to non-Brahmins, 25% to Muslims and 25% to Christians and other communities. So that really marks the beginning of social justice and social awareness and social equality in every way. So by the 1940s, 50s, the city was really a place where the upper caste couldn't hold sway over the lower because there was a strong identity of self-value. So you had people like Periyar and Anna, etc., who came with very, very noble intentions of creating a system of equality among all the communities. I know that in today's world, people will not like this analysis because the world has gone in a completely different direction today. But this is how it really began. And when they needed a medium to take forward their messages, they found the world of theater. Ironically, it was the Congress that discovered the power of theater. You had a freedom fighter called Satyamurti, who died during the Quit India movement. But in 1920s, he was a very powerful orator, theater personality, an actor, uh, uh, you know, a member of the Madras legislature and all that. He found theater people to be very good in attracting crowds. And he got the biggest names in the world of theater to come and campaign for the freedom movement. When he died in the 1940s, his successor, Rajaji, did not have anything to do with the theatre people. And they felt rootless. And that is when they went and aligned themselves with Periyar and Annadure. And the world of cinema had already come in by that time. Hollywood, or at that time it was not Hollywood, but the great studios in Kodambakam with actors and all that. Beginning with 1950s, Tamil cinema transformed itself into a social message-bearing medium. The first film, there were films even during the pre-independent uh, era, but the really big blockbuster was a film called Parashakti, which catapulted Shivaji Ganeshan to fame in the early 1950s. 
Then came M.G. Ramachandran with his own messages of social equality. And from then on, we have never looked back. Cinema and Tamil Nadu politics go together. Every hero in Tamil cinema aspires to become the chief minister. Of course, a woman did, there is no doubt, but that woman was an exception. She was one of her kind. But there were every hero, when he starts off, he has a fan club, which begins with giving blood donations on his birthday, or for celebrating, and then for conducting camps, health camps. It starts off with a very noble intention. Every Friday or whenever there is a Friday, and all Tamil cinemas release on Fridays, by the way. They, they'll be bursting of crackers outside the cinema theater. They'll climb a huge cutout of the hero and anoint it with milk and light camphor at its base. It's a highly homoerotic uh, situation. Men celebrating a hero for whom they could be doing anything. And that is how they all start dreaming of a career in politics. Eventually, some of them make it, many of them don't. But in recent years, I feel that that has begun to come down to a certain extent, particularly with the proliferation of social media. People have begun asking questions as to what people can do for you. So maybe Tamil Nadu itself is going to transform over a period of time. Chennai itself will probably transform. In conclusion, what is it that makes Chennai uh, a different kind of a city? And now I have been privileged to live in Calcutta, in Delhi, uh, spent a lot of time in Bombay and Bangalore, and then I've now been living since 93 in Chennai. I'll be completing 30 years in Chennai next year. So one aspect of the city is that Calcutta has got a certain, you know, Calcutta is the city that I totally align with because that's where I really grew up. That's one city which is forever in the past. And, you know, that's where it is, it's, you know, there's a certain joy. It's like, you know, the final scenes in Sahib Bibi or Gulam, everything is slowly, you know, darker and darker and darker. And, but, you know, life is going on. I'm sure I'll be stoned in Bengal when I go back there, but then that's how it is. And then you've got Bangalore, which is on a super fast escalator, reach the top floor, but you're in multiple, all your organs are still on the first floor. You know, your heart, your lungs, your kidney and all are still coming up. But then you're there, up there, world class. So Chennai is somewhere in the middle. You know, what it does is it measures its steps. Slowly it moves. It moves. It doesn't stop. It's a progressive city. But it takes its own time. And all the time it is looking back to see, is my baggage, my band Baja Bharat, is it coming along with me? It doesn't lose anything. So you'll be having this guy working in an IT industry. He'll suddenly take leave. Where are you going? No, sir, in our temple there is a festival. I have to go for it. <laughs> So in a, suddenly you'll find he'll be working, he'll be talking to somebody in the United States of America, cutting edge technology. Next day morning he'll be carrying something on his head and going to the temple. So they will never lose their past. They will carry that heritage forever. So this is, this is probably what keeps Chennai from becoming a Bombay or a Bangalore. But does Chennai want to become a Bombay or a Bangalore is a different question altogether. So that is where I would leave you with that thought. Thank you very much. Thank Shira, you so much, Sriram. Sorry. Thank you so much. Chennai is the city of my birth, so I'm, it's been absolutely wonderful. One thing, if you could shed a little bit of light on, when, in the context of Madras, uh, the women's weeklies, Kum Kumudam, Kumkumam, Ananda Vigadan, there, that was really a space where actually feminism or feminist uh, 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 thought uh, kind of originated in the kitchens and in, so in the guise of talking about women's, uh, a woman's role in the kitchen or how to bring up your children or the best recipe, they became crucibles of uh, amazing feminist dialogue and discourse, uh, talks about, uh, you know, uh, caste casteism and there have been some amazing women writers who have emerged, people like Shiva Shankari who told popular stories with these themes. Will you elaborate on that a little bit? One is I feel that there was a high degree of literacy uh, in the city uh, from very early on and you find particularly as I said the missionary influence. So the first women writers were really Christian converts, those who had learned under the missionaries. Yeah. They were really the Kripa Bhai Satyanathan and others, they were the ones who really started writing. But later, uh, the undoubted pioneer when it comes to women's writing is a woman called Vaimu Kode Nayakiyamal. Vaimu Ko, as she called herself. Illiterate, but a fantastic storyteller. So the mother-in-law encourages her to read and write, learn how to read and write. She begins learning that. Eventually buys a defunct magazine called Jagan Mohini and becomes probably 
the first woman publisher of India and ran that magazine from the 1920s till her death in 1961 or so. And uh, that was the, she fought for freedom, she went to prison, a very interesting uh, life. And my guess is that was really a very big inspiration and there were several others who would then follow. So by the 1940s, you find that even in the Tamil magazines, the women's interest was never neglected. There was a lot of uh, articles and stories that, you know, uh, women were writing, women were contributing. And uh, slowly that gains ground. And as you say, by the 60s and 70s, there was a huge base of uh, women's magazines that were coming out that were catering to everything from bhakti to, uh, you know, modern thought. It was all there. That's a, it's a great thing. It's an aspect that I haven't really looked into, but I agree with you. It's a, it's a point that needs to be looked at. Thanks, Sri Ram. That was a most entertaining talk. Thank you. I have to tell you that I was born in Chennai, uh -huh. okay? Went to the same college as you, FMS, which I've just figured out from Ruchi <laughs> just now. And uh, I married uh, a Malayali whose home was in, um, in Chennai. So he's just gone to the loo, but he'll come in a minute. So I, and I worked for a bank called Grinley's Bank, which was uh, the British bank of yore and the largest British bank uh, in Chennai and of course in India at the time. So we had an office at Rajaji Salai. So you've taken me down memory lane. Thank you. And I was also on the, you know, committee of the famous Madras Chamber of Commerce <laughs> for years and years. But I had no idea what all this history behind it was. So uh, thank you. As I said, it was most entertaining and I'm so, so glad we came. Thank you. And I'm going to take your number because now that you've been here 30 years, I have to spend my time more productively going looking at various aspects of Chennai, which sure. I've obviously missed in the nooks and crannies. You're most welcome. I think Bittu Saigal had yeah, a question. I, I, I had a very small question to ask. Chennai is in water hell right now. And as I understand it, the entire architecture of Chennai was built in such a way that uh, tanks, the tank irrigation systems that were there, there was a certain social custom that you don't pollute the water because the next guy is using it. That's one part of it. The other part of it was that eels from the sea, they come up and they come to breed. And they had to be able to build the tanks in such a way that the eels were not interrupted. According to me, unless that happens again, that the eels come back, Chennai has no future because there will be no water ever. It's, so I, I don't know whether any of the history that you had why did they build the tanks in such a way that the eels could come or did they just understand that that was the way it was? I, I'm not able to give you an answer on this because this aspect was new to me, but I can tell you definitely about the way the tanks were constructed. So uh, in Mailapur, which is where I live, there are uh, seven, uh, there, there were rather seven water bodies. The first was an enormous water body of 77 acres, which was called the long tank of Mailapur, where the British were actually conducting regattas and all that, rowing and stuff. And it was believed that was on the western part of Mailapur. And when that would fill, the water would come through underground catchment areas to a second water body in the heart of Mailapur. Then it would go to the Kapalishwarar temple tank, then from there to the Madhava Permal temple tank, then to the Virupakshishwara temple tank and finally go to the Buckingham Canal. So it was a chain. And in a city which doesn't have any gradient, this is a phenomenal achievement because there must have been such understanding of even mild and minor slopes that this could happen. In 1917, they filled that entire 77 acres and constructed that colony called Tinagar, Tyagaraya Nagar. So that was built on the long tank of Mailapur as a government scheme. They didn't think the water body was important. They felt housing was more important and they filled the tank and another 300 acres surrounding it and that became the retail hub of Tinagar today. The story is that on the day after the 2015 floods, the only shops that were open were the gold jewellery shops in Tinagar and people were inside it buying uh, jewels. So that is our, uh, our craze for gold. But uh, the, uh, that was Tinagar. When Tinagar dried, when you know, it became a housing colony, 
it took till 1940 for the troops to get filled up. And so that other tank in Mailapur, it dried up by 1947. That became a park in 1948. And it still is a park. It's called the Nageshwar Rao Park. And even today when you go to the park, you have to go down into the park. Because the, it, it is still at the depth of the tank and when it rains, it floods every year. So that indicates that it was a water body. When that stopped, the Mailapur temple tank depended on rainwater catchment in the surrounding areas. And as long as there were tiled houses with gardens and with unpaved courtyards, there was enough and more water coming into the tank and nobody realized the absence of the long tank and the other tank drying up. But in, by 1975, much of that had gone, so the tank went dry. When that tank went dry, the whole of Mailapur went dry after that. And it took till 1995 for the tank to fill up again, almost 20 years. And now it fills up regularly because of this half-hearted rainwater. You know, how much nature gives back even with some small steps that uh, we do take at the end of the day. But I agree with you that there is really no permanent solution. So today we manage by building huge storage reservoirs. Into, and then you have the Krishna, you know, the Telugu Ganga scheme, as it is called, which M.G. Ramchandran and N.T. Ramarao and others really engineered, where the water from the Krishna actually comes with Sai Baba's help, incidentally, and uh, it finally comes to Madras, and uh, that again we are heavily... We, we have taken water from everywhere, from irrigation tanks in Tanjavur, from the Palar River, from the Krishna River, we've, and all the surrounding... Uh, rural areas of Madras, they've all, they've all become sources of water supply to the city. It's one never-ending story. Actually, uh, you know, uh, we are in the foundation of eight problems. And we studied that the topography was very clearly understood. Because if you take the car from the airport and go the other way, not towards the city, and then come around all the way to Ennore, all along that periphery, there are lakes. Yeah. And they all follow the topography and the water flow during monsoon. So they knew that they needed to conserve water. There were many lakes created in line of the natural flows. Yeah, of course, you know, and the, the, the obvious uh, uh, thing is that what happens, they start encroaching and all. But now some of those are being revived and I think that uh, that will improve the water security. And in the south you have a huge marsh south of the city. Almost 75% of it has now become the IT corridor. The last 25% is now being kept as it is and that will, that will contribute to the city as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Sri Ram. Subscribe to Sarmaya and be a part of the stories and conversations around art, history and culture.